So next, let's think about risk premiums and betas. Where we were is we had expressed expected returns, the risk premium, in terms of a covariance with the discount factor or in terms of a covariance with consumption growth. I emphasize that covariance, not the variance of the return, matter. It's more traditional in finance to express expected returns in, in models with regression betas on the right-hand side. And it's easy enough to, to get to that representation. Let's just take that covariance of M uh, with, uh, with the return and multiply and divide by the variance of the discount factor. Or with consumption growth, let's multiply and divide by the variance of the consumption growth. Put all the other stuff in parentheses over here. And then covariance divided by variance is a regression coefficient. It is, by definition, a beta. So we write the same model as uh, expected return is proportional to beta times a parameter known as the market price of risk. These are called market prices of risk. I've added an I here to emphasize the point is to distinguish why some assets are different than others. So I is different from J. Why is asset I different from asset J? Why do value stocks pay more than growth stocks, according to this model? Because I, asset I, has a different beta than asset J. They all share the common lambda. So the beta, the covariance, is the thing that makes one asset different from each other, another. This notation suggests the common procedure. How would you go about checking a model like this? How would you use a model like this? Well, you could run two, do it in two steps. To evaluate the covariance, your first step is you run a time series regression. You run over time the return on an individual asset, on a constant, on consumption growth. I'm doing my second model. And this, this regression is run over time for each individual asset. The point of that regression is to find the beta coefficient, the tendency of this asset to fall in times when consumption falls. Then that's an input to the model. The model says expected returns should be high where betas are high. And the lambda, the market price of risk, is the slope coefficient uh, re uh, relating expected returns to betas. Alpha is what is the word Greek letter we use to talk about deviations from the model. So I put it in parentheses. It shouldn't be there. But if it is there, we call alpha the deviations. It's the expected return over and above compensation for risk generated by the model. So graphically, the, the standard picture of asset pricing looks like this. This is what the world should look like. If you took all securities and lined them up by their betas, some securities, like interest rates, they're constant. They don't have any beta. Other securities, when consumption growth goes up and down, they have whatever betas they have. But their expected returns should line up with their betas. The ones with higher tendency to fall in bad times have to pay their investors higher expected returns to get those investors to hold them. Lambda is the slope coefficient in this relationship. When you get a higher beta, that tells you how much more expected return you have to pay. And alpha is what we call the deviation from the relationship. Here's an asset with alpha. It's giving its investors higher expected returns than, its, uh, than the compensation for risk that they should need to get. So just multiplying and dividing gets us to the standard expected return beta style of model. This is the consumption capital asset pricing model. Now, a few comments on this model. First of all, the notation is traditional, but watch out here. Expected return is the thing we're trying to explain. And beta is the right-hand variable. We're used to beta being slope coefficients. But no, in this cross-section relationship, beta is like the x, expected return is like the y, and lambda is like the slope coefficient. Beta is the thing we're using to explain expected returns. Another way of seeing the difference, lambda, the market price of risk, is the same for everybody. Right? There's no i in here. There's no i in there. Uh, beta is the thing that's different from one asset, of one asset for another. This relationship, usually market prices of risk are just taken as free parameters. That's kind of cheating, because this shows us that a, a model tells us what the market prices of risk should be. The market price of risk is higher if you live in a risky economy or if the, if the risk aversion is higher. Naturally, if it's either riskier or higher risk aversion, it's going to take more, uh, more expected return to induce investors to hold those assets that are, that are risky in terms of high beta. The I notation emphasizes most of the common ways of misunderstanding this. What is this about? What is this statement trying to tell us? It's about 
why some securities have higher returns on average than other securities. Why did the value stocks for Fama French have higher returns on average than the growth stocks? It's not about why returns vary over time. Why is there this crazy volatility of returns? That we can address. That's not what this model is trying to talk about. It's not about why did IBM go up yesterday. It's about the expected return over long periods of time. And it's not about which is going to go up tomorrow. We're not trying to predict stock returns over time. We're trying to understand why long-term average returns are higher on some securities than other securities. That's what the E part means here. Again, I emphasize it over and over again. It's one of the classic theories of finance. What does this tell us? It tells us that the variance of the return does not matter. What matters is the beta, the tendency of the return to fall in bad times as measured by consumption growth. Another way of saying that same classic proposition of finance is that only systematic risk is priced. What do those words mean? Well, think of running a regression of the return on the discount factor or consumption growth and a residual. That breaks apart the volatility of this return into two components. The volatility of the return is the component correlated with the, with the discount factor or with consumption growth and an idiosyncratic component. Since those are regression, those two things are uncorrelated with each other. So variance of return, it doesn't matter. Variance of return, you can break it apart into two components. The systematic component, this varies with the discount factor, and the idiosyncratic or diversifiable component. Another way of saying covariance is what matters is that only the systematic component of risk matters. The idiosyncratic component of risk does not matter. Only the part perfectly correlated with them generates a risk premium. You've seen here uh, a first example of what we mean by an asset pricing model. We have a general theory in terms of a discount factor. But to make it operational, to know what to run regressions on, we need something to translate to connect the discount factor to real data. What I've done here is I've used a utility function to connect the discount factor to consumption growth, so we run regressions on consumption growth. Where we're going is other kinds of asset pricing models, which will work the same way. We'll use other theoretical ideas to connect the discount factor to other kinds of data. Fama and French's paper connected the discount factor to the returns on a value portfolio, a small portfolio, and so forth. Well, we'll have to think about that, but this shows you the logic of an expected return beta asset pricing model and shows you where these classic propositions about the nature of risk and risk premiums in the theory of finance come from.